when you eat, think about those squiggly lines and we think about status epilepticus. I feel as if we get overwhelmed. We think, oh my God, they're seizing. There's so many different medications. There's medications that they're on. There's medications that I have to give. How can I muddle through this mess? And it's really not that complicated for us. This is my friend Carolina, who is teaching epilepsy and seizures in Vietnam about a week ago. And I put this picture in there because I feel like sometimes it's larger than life. But I want to bring it down to something that's very straightforward. We think about different types of seizures. There's convulsive. That's the one we can see, the generalized tonic-clonic status. Then there's the non-convulsive. Typically, we're going to see that in the ICU. 20% of patients will have non-convulsive status. But you can see this in the emergency medicine arena. Somebody who comes in comatose, somebody who is catatonic, or maybe the positive symptoms of twitching, nystagmus, or agitation. Anybody who doesn't have a normal neurostatus, you got to think about non-convulsive status epilepticus. Refractory status epilepticus means you gave the adequate dosing of benzos, then you gave an anti-seizure medication, and they're still seizing. Not good. Super refractory means it's been going on for over 60 minutes. And new onset refractory, we call it NORSE, those are the patients who've never had seizures before. They don't have a history or a profile or risk factors. All of a sudden, they're seizing like mad women. And it's most often women, and they typically will have something that's an, a perineoplastic issue or an anti-NMDA receptor issue, something like that. That's when it gets really bizarre. The good news is that first up, we only need to worry about convulsive and maybe the non-convulsive. So that's a lot of different seizure types. Let's just make it simple because it really is simple. But as it turns out, we're not doing so well. And I'll tell you the one thing we're not doing well. This is our definition of status. Five minutes or more of continuous seizure or recurrent seizure without recovery in between. There have been so many changes in the definition of status over the decades because there's still a lot more that we have to learn about status. A lot more we have to learn about how it happens, how we can treat it, the best agents to treat it. It is not a finished science, which is sometimes why it may seem complicated, not that complicated. The diagnosis really is with EEG. How many people have access to EEG in their emergency department? Yeah, a couple of us, a few of us. It's a luxury. I've been at my institution now for four years. I've never worked at a place where I can write an order Within 30 minutes, I get a tech that comes down, applies it, video, does 30 minutes, sends it to the neurologist, they read it. It's amazing. But not everybody has that, especially in where I am, the surrounding hospitals, we're the only tertiary care center for a, a big region. And those surrounding hospitals, I say, every time I'm in the neuro ICU on Friday afternoon, I get the call. I think my patient might be seizing. And like clockwork, I get that call. And they have to send them to us because they don't have EEG. And it's a problem. But now we've got some limited modality EEG that are easy to put on that these regional hospitals can use. There's a lot of different brands that are coming out and they're getting better and better where you either just put two probes here, two probes behind the ear, and it transmits to the software, goes to either telemetry to a neurologist or it's working just off of the program to tell you if that patient is seizing. These tools can stay on for 24 hours. They're great. It can reduce the need to transfer your patient if you think they might be seizing. We know the first steps. Figure out the glucose. Get a neuro exam. And I put that there just to say, I think that sometimes we are intubating patients a little bit too early. If you wait and you do a good neuro exam and you think about, is this status, is this a subclinical seizure, and you treat it, a patient may wake up and show you that they don't need to be intubated. Now, that's a judgment call at the bedside, but I do believe 
that we're intubating too early and we can wait a little bit longer. Head of the bed up, make sure they're not aspirating as best you can, but think about it. The first line agent is benzos. We'll go over that. And you're going to get a CT when you can just to rule out other reasons. Maybe they have TBI. Maybe they have an old stroke. Maybe there's a bleed or hydrocephalus. Most status is medication noncompliance, but there could be something else cooking. So you're really just getting a CT to see if there's anything else interesting going on. And of course, you're going to get your labs. There's a bunch of labs you could get. And depending on the clinical picture and the patient's history, you're going to get more or less. And then the EEG. Let's start with those agents because this is where we're falling short of which agents and how much to give. In the pre-hospital world, they may have started the ball rolling for you because the Rampart study showed us in 2012 that they can use IM medications. IM midazolam is actually in the pre-hospital better than IV lorazepam. It was faster to get patients to stop seizing. Now, the reason for that is they didn't have to take the time to put an IV in. That's okay, but all this to say, if the patient arrives in your department and they're seizing, the pre-hospital may have started with that IM dosing, but you can also do that if you don't have an, a line. Think about the IM agents. Then it's up to us. And here's the money. 0.1 mg per kg of lorazepam, up to four milligrams. The most common thing that I see happening is we give two milligrams. Not only in the emergency department, in the ICU, somebody's seizing and the nurse goes to get the lorazepam and comes back and gives two. They say, the dose is four. If you're using 0.1 mg per kg, a dose of two milligrams would be a 20 kilo patient. Now, how many 20 kilo patients do you guys see? Give four milligrams and then give it again in three to five minutes if the seizures haven't stopped. That's our biggest mistake. And the reason that's so important is because we know if a patient hasn't stopped seizing within five minutes, because most of them do, most of them, by the time you get the medication to the bedside, the seizure has stopped and everybody's happy. But if they don't, then they're going to be harder to stop that seizure. And then as they get harder, as you wait longer, they get closer to morbidity and mortality. Mortality for status in general for adults is about 25%. For pediatrics, it's about 5%. But the longer we wait to stop that seizure, the closer they get to that and the worse off they're going to be, the harder it is to stop. So we need to act quickly. You see the pediatric dosing there. It's the same medications, just the weight-based dosing. Don't underdose. Stop it. Some people say, I, I don't want to give too much benzo because then they're going to have respiratory depression and then I'm going to be intubating them. This study answers that question. And this is from 2016. These guys looked, and these are epilepsy experts, right? They looked at 38 randomized control studies to, to figure out patients who get adequate benzo for status versus patients who got placebo. And what they found out just answers this question for me. The patients who got benzo had a lower rate of respiratory depression than those who got placebo. So what does that tell us? If your patient is in status, their respiratory is depressed. They're going to need to be intubated if you don't do anything. But when you give the benzo, you stop the status and then they start breathing again. So this to me is solid evidence that we really need to give that four milligrams and give it again if they don't stop. Give it soon. Give it adequately. Oh, here's the dosing again. 0.1 mg per kg up to four milligrams. I'm going to have you guys singing this on your way home. So what's the next step? If that didn't work and the repeat dose didn't work, now we're moving on to the next agents. This is from the ESET trial in 2019. They compared levetiracetam, phosphenitoin, and valproate to see in patients who were seizing beyond the benzo, which one works the best. And what they found out was they all work the same. The one thing they did notice was that phosphenitoin had a higher rate of hypotension. So that's something to be careful of. But whatever you have in your Pixis, in your kit, 
that's what you should use. It really doesn't matter. So second line, we think of any of these agents. The phosphany is 20 mg per kg, the valproate 40 mg per kg, and then the levetiracetam is an interesting dosing paradigm. In our shop, we say if your patient's less than 100 kilos, you get two grams. If they're greater than 100 kilos, you get four grams. If the neurologist comes down, they might give another gram, but it's really pretty straightforward. And in case you haven't noticed, it's not that fine-tuned. Essentially, when you think about beyond the benzo, we're throwing the spaghetti against the refrigerator and seeing what sticks. And I'll show you a little bit why we're doing that. For pediatrics, same medications, different dosing. Here's the diagram. And what you see here is inhibitory synapse, excitatory synapse. These are the two synapses that govern whether or not your patient is seizing. The inhibition is the GABA receptor. Benzos work on the GABA receptor. Propofol works on the GABA receptor. Phenobarbital works on it. But what happens to that GABA receptor is it starts involuting and it goes away. So you don't have receptors to work on. So after a while, you can throw as much benzo as you want. It's not going to do anything because you ran out of receptors. They all said, we're done. Now we have to work on the, in, in the excitatory receptors, the NMDA, the AMPA receptors. And that's what some of the other medications work on. So when you get beyond the benzo and then that second agent, now we're trying to figure out mental model. We're trying to figure out what receptors do I have that are still going to work, which is why we have multiple agents. Look at all these agents. I'm sure you have all of these. And by the time you get to this stage, I hope there's a neurologist with their little black bag standing next to you saying, I think we're going to use this. But the thing to think about is there's no magic to this. All of these agents can be used. You just have to look at your patient and say, do they have renal issues? Then I might want to readily dose my levetiracetam. Do they have liver issues? Then I may want to think about valproate. And, and each one of these agents has their own sort of side effects that you want to think about and profile. But I will tell you, and the neurointensivists in the crowd will back me up with this, when we're getting to this point, it's, let's try this, let's try that, unless there's a solid contraindication. Make this into a card, keep it with you. But really, I hope this patient isn't still in your emergency department. This is my protocol from Dartmouth, and you'll see if you look at the fine print, it's the same thing that we just talked about. Benzos, 0.1 mg per kg, up to four milligrams, repeat, then add an anti-seizure medication, either levetiracetam, lecosamide we have, valproate or phosphenitoin. When you get beyond that, now we're thinking about all of the other agents. The message really is, it's pretty basic what we do. Let's not lose the, the basics of it by thinking ahead too much. I don't want you to be thinking about ketamine and phenobarbital and all that stuff when all you really need to think about is the lorazepam, four milligrams, repeat it, and then add the anti-seizure med of your choice if you still need to. But do it quickly, do it early, do it adequately, and you probably won't have to intubate. So we have all of these different types of seizures. Fortunately, we are responsible for the first two, convulsive, non-convulsive. The rest is icing on the cake. What I want you to remember is get in there early, give enough benzo, don't underdose, and then take the time to consider, do I really need to intubate this patient? We'll talk later about a new language for functional seizures. 